Hello, I'm Brian Boucher. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at some financial statement excerpts and footnote disclosures about long-lived assets, both tangible and intangible, to see what kind of information we can pull out of the financial statements related to the topics that we've been talking about so far this week. Let's get to it. Okay, the disclosure we're going to look at is for Lions Incorporated. They manufacture Hurleys, which are the sticks used in the sport hurling, which is one of the most popular sports in Ireland, I believe. Anyway, one of the things we'll see when we look at Lions Disclosure is that in 2008, they acquired Finch Corporation, but the acquisition hasn't worked out that well, and Lions had to take a goodwill impairment charge in 2012. We're going to use Lyons' footnote disclosures to answer the following questions. For property, plant, and equipment, we're going to try to find out what's the historical cost of their PP&E, how much new PP&E did the company acquire during 2012, and what's the historical cost of the PP&E that Lyons sold during the year. For intangibles, we'll see if we can figure out how many years Lyons has left before its patents expire, and we'll talk about how the goodwill impairment affected Lyons financial statements in ratios in 2012. Here is the asset part of the balance sheet for Lyons. First question on our agenda was what is the historical cost of PP&E? We can see PP&E on the balance sheet, but we don't see the historical cost. All we get is one line with the net number, property, plant, and equipment net. So if we go to footnote 7, that's where Lyons discloses more detail about their property and equipment. So we can see here in the footnote, we have the original cost, accumulated depreciation, property and equipment net. And then they give us some detail below that on the estimated service lives or the useful lives of their PP&E. So now we can answer the question, what is the historical cost of PP&E? It was $825 million in 2012 and $768.5 million in 2011. This is a tangential question, but I always thought that land was not depreciated. Why is land included in the list of assets that have accumulated depreciation? No, that's a good tangential question. Land is not depreciated. For some reason, the historical tradition is to present property, plant, and equipment in this manner, including land, which is not depreciated, with buildings, machinery, equipment, which is depreciated. Just keep in mind that none of that accumulated depreciation applies to the land. The land comes on at historical cost and stays there unless there has to be some write down due to impairment. Another tangential question. Why are the useful lives such big ranges? I mean, how useful is it to know that buildings are depreciated over three to 50 years? Another good tangential question. I agree. This part of the disclosure generally is somewhat deficient in that it gives you too big a range to figure out exactly what kind of useful lives the company is doing. And Lyons Company is especially egregious in combining assets that have three to 50 year lives. Um, if I was an analyst or a big investor, I would complain about this disclosure and ask the company to be a little bit more specific. Okay, moving on again, I am going to keep track of a PP&E T account. This is the original cost, which will carry through the example. We'll need this to figure out some information later. So the next question is how much property plant equipment was acquired in 2012? And to answer this, I pulled in the investing section of Lyons Statement of Cash Flows and their supplemental cash flow disclosures, which are at the bottom of the statement. And what we can see here is they had cash capital expenditures of 29.4 during 2012. They had non-cash acquisition of property for of 41.2, which gives you a total of 70.6 of PP&E acquired during the year. So bringing up our T account, we can add that as one of the debit entries. So our PP&E increased by 70.6 during the year because of the cash capital expenditures and the non-cash acquisition of property. Why is CAPEX a negative number, but non-cash acquisitions are a positive number? And what is a non-cash acquisition anyway? Did Lions trade baseball cards for the property? Baseball cards? I think it's more likely that Lions would have to trade Pokemon cards to get property these days. 
So good question, what is a non-cash acquisition of property? A couple examples. One is sometimes that companies make acquisitions using shares of stock rather than cash. So if you acquire a company using stock, there's no cash involved. And so that would be a non-cash acquisition of the property. And sometimes the seller of the property provides the debt financing. So instead of getting cash from a bank and then using that to buy the, the property, the seller loans us the money, but then no cash exchange hands and it's considered a non-cash acquisition if we get seller financing. Now it's just the convention that the cash capital expenditures are shown as negative, a use of cash on the cash flow statement, and the non-cash acquisitions are shown positive, it's an acquisition of property. Treat them both as positive numbers and add them together to get CapEx. Next, we're going to calculate the historical cost of property plant equipment that was sold in 2012. So we've got our PP&E T account where we just filled in the amount of acquired PP&E. And all we need to do is plug a credit to make this balance and we figure out the historical cost that PP&E was sold. So we've got 768.8 plus 70.6 doesn't equal 825.1, the ending balance. So it must be the case that we sold PP&E during the year. And the credit that makes this balance is 14.0. How do you know that we sold 14 million of PP and D? Are there no other transactions that would affect the account? Good question. The other transaction that could run through here would be an impairment of PP and E. If the market value dropped below cost and we had to write it down, that would show up in here as well. We're going to continue to go through the disclosures and check whether we can find any evidence of an impairment. And if not, then this 14.0 sold will make sense. Plus we can find other data which will confirm that this is the right number. So let's do the journal entry to see how everything fits together. So we've got a debit to cash of 8.8 .8 million. Where did I get that? If you look up here on the investing section of the statement of cash flows, we have proceeds from disposal of property plant equipment, 8.8 .8 million. That was the cash flow that we received from selling PP&E. And then we know from our T account that the original cost of the PP&E was $14 million. That was the credit to PP&E. We go to the statement of cash flows, the operating section. You can see there's a line, loss on sale of assets, 0 0.2. So we booked a loss of $200,000 on selling the assets. Since it's a loss, that's a debit. And so we fill in the loss on sale of assets for 200000 Journal entry doesn't balance. What are we missing? Well, we always have to take out the accumulated depreciation as well. So if we debit accumulated depreciation for $5 million to remove the accumulated depreciation associated with the sale, then that'll balance our journal entry. And what it looks like is we sold plant and equipment that had a net book value of $9 million. So 14 minus 5. We sold that 9 million for 8.8 .8 million, and as a result, took a loss of 200,000 on the sale. So, the net book value of the PPE that was sold was 9 million. Why did we sell it at a loss? Is that bad news? No, it's not bad news, and this is a good review of something we talked about a couple videos ago. A gain or loss on sale does not mean that we sold it for less or more than its market value. We probably sold it for its market value. The gain or loss represents the fact that we didn't depreciate it enough or we depreciated it too much. So in this case, the loss means that we hadn't depreciated the asset enough by the time we sold it. So its book value was above its market value. And so the loss just corrects the fact that we hadn't depreciated it enough, but we did sell it for its market value. Now I want to do one more thing, which is try to balance the accumulated depreciation T account as another way just to make sure that we've taken care of everything that's happened relative to buying and selling and depreciating equipment during the year for Lions Incorporated. So here's the accumulated depreciation T account, contra asset. We don't know the beginning and ending balance yet, but we know that we have this debit of $5 million, which took out the accumulated depreciation on the equipment that was sold during the year, the plant and equipment. We go back to footnote seven, and here we can see the beginning and ending balance of accumulated depreciation. Beginning balance was 438.3, ending balance 496.5.
So that means that depreciation expense has to be 63.2. That's the credit that we need to make this account balance. Because the two things that affect accumulated depreciation is we add depreciation expense as a credit to increase the account, and then we subtract the accumulated depreciation on the equipment we sold, we debit the account to reduce it. So the number that makes this balance is 63.2. And then if we pop back to the operating section of the statement of cash flows for Lyons, you can see that sure enough, their depreciation was 63.2 during 2012. And so we made everything balance by going through all of the footnote disclosures, filling out our T accounts, verify that we weren't missing anything, and in doing so, we figured out the original cost of the property, plant, and equipment sold during the year. Wow, that was a lot of time spent on PP&E. Will we ever get to the goodwill part? Yes, let's go there now. Moving on to the intangible assets in Lyons and report, their footnote 8 summarized goodwill and other intangibles. So the top of the note is goodwill. We'll come back to that later. Below that are the other intangible assets, which were trademarks and patents. And we get the amortization period for both trademarks and patents below. What we're going to answer first is how long before the patents expire. So we can see the accumulated amortization is 11.3 million. The original cost was 32.3 million. So we can divide 11.3 by 32.3 and see that 35% of the original cost has been amortized, has been used up. Well, if the total period for the patents is 16 years, 35% of 16 years is 5.6 years that have been used up. So if we take 16 minus 5.6, it means that there's 10.4 years left and of course, this is on average because this is the average of all the patents that they have. So we can use the percent of the patents that have been amortized so far to figure out how much of the patents have been quote unquote used up and then back into how many years on average are left before the patents expire. This would have been a really cool calculation if you had not messed it up. What about salvage value? You forgot to add it into your calculation. Hey, I didn't mess this one up. So in the case of a patent, it's reasonable to assume the salvage value is zero because once the patent expires, then any competitor can use that technology in their own product and the technology advantage is gone. So for the case of a patent and, and a lot of intangibles, you could assume safely zero salvage value. Now notice we did not do this kind of calculation for plants and equipment because in that case, there probably is a salvage value and if we tried to do this kind of analysis, there'd be a lot more error. So you can do it for intangible assets, but it's harder to do for tangible assets like property, plant, and equipment. So finally, we're going to talk about the effect of the goodwill impairment. So if you look at the top of the footnote, you can see the impairment charge, 285.3. So the journal entry for that was they recorded a loss, debit loss, which is going to show up on the income statement, 285.3. Credit goodwill reduce the asset by the same amount. And as you can see, that brought down the asset quite a bit. If we flip over to the statement of cash flows, the operating section, here you can see the net loss during the year was a loss of almost 100 million, so 99.4 million. So this goodwill impairment caused the company to have a net loss, which will also negatively affect their retained earnings and their stockholders equity. But there was no impact on cash from operations. And it won't affect EBITDA either because it will be a non-cash charge that's added back. And it's really striking where if you look at the top line, Lyons went from 100 million of net earnings to 100 million of net loss, basically. So their profit swung down 280 million because of this impairment charge. But yet their cash from operations went up, reflecting the fact that this was a non-cash charge. If we go to their balance sheet, we can see that total assets dropped from 2011 to 2012, driven by that big drop in goodwill from the write-off. And so what this means is any ratios you look at that include earnings, assets, or equity will be adversely affected by the goodwill write-off, which is almost all of them, right? ROE, ROA, asset turnover, all of those ratios are going to be biased this year by that goodwill write-off. 
And to get a better comparison of how the company actually performed, you may want to add back that goodwill write-off before you calculate the ratios to get a better picture. But although that'll give you a better picture of how the company performed this year, we don't want to totally ignore the goodwill impairment charge because it does suggest that the company made a bad acquisition and that has potential implication for future cash flows and that we might not expect the company to perform as well given that their acquisition didn't turn out as well as expected. Now do you understand the effect of a goodwill impairment charge? As I said, it has no impact on cash flow or EBITDA. Yes, I see that now. But, we still have not talked about deferred taxes. Excuse me, that was a little bit rude that you cut her off, especially since she knows what she's talking about. She's been paying attention to these videos. We'll talk about deferred taxes in week eight, and you're welcome to come back, but you need to be more polite to your fellow virtual students. Okay, that wraps up our look at tangible and intangible long-lived assets. We have only one more type of asset that we're going to look at before we move to the other side of the balance sheet. And that asset is investments in other companies' stock or other companies' debt. I'll see you next time. See you next video.